I have, I guess, been given the chair. Yeah, double entendre. <laughs> All right. Let's start with a prayer. Uh, Father, just thank you. You were the God of mercy, glory. You shined your light into us. You infuse us with your gift. Help us give this gift to everybody else. Be with us. Sit beside us. You know, put your arm around us. You know, let us just be in your presence today. Your son's name. Amen. All right. You see the picture of the rabbits behind us. You know, Dave and I have had a good time kind of going through the fluffle of trails that are available. And uh, sometimes I, you know, I look at it and um, he likes the regular stuff and I like the esoteric stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to start out with uh, just a real quick look at Corinth. Um, you know, we say Philippi was a city of love, brotherly love. Actually, it's not. That's Philadelphia <laughs> as a city of brotherly love. And then we go, you know, look at Paul, then we go to Athens, and, and Athens is where, um, you know, you had this idea of wisdom, you know, and Paul at Mars Hill is that. And then he comes into Corinth, and Corinth was um, one of the big battles in Roman Rome conquest of Greece and everything. And it was just pretty much destroyed in 146 BC. And then it was rebuilt. And Julius Caesar loved the city, became one of his favorite cities, you know, for Paul. Paul loved it. You know, then later Nero loved it. So you got different reasons for people liking the city. The thing about it was that um, uh, it was described as a place of proverbial wickedness. Uh, you know, had this energy, all these traitors and everybody coming through. It was riches. It was noisy. There were a lot of different cults. There was a retirement center, you know, for the ex-military. They would come in and, and retire to the area. They, they enjoyed it. And uh, so basically it was an upscale Moss Isley. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and the, for the morality considered part of it, you know, they were very religious, concerning their worship for Aphrodite. Of course, Aphrodite's temple, which is on top of the hill, it had about a thousand prostitutes. I mean, sacred priestesses, you know, and, uh, and so they even had their own word uh, kind of describing activities and, uh, and the city. And it was Corinthia Zetai. Took a long time to get that down. And basically it means to Corinth. And you can infer what you <laughs> what that may entail. Um, but it was sometimes not a good thing to be considered a Corinthian. And uh, depending on, you know, looking at it. And it's kind of like we look at that and no wonder the new believers were plagued by numerous problems that cropped up. Again, in looking at Second Corinthians, we realize that so much of it is based on previous problems and previous things. So really today, I'm just going to go through a timeline and give a little bit of a commentary on that timeline and you know, how Paul fits in all this. So, you know, Paul's on the second missionary journey and at 80, about 50 he gets to Corinth and he establishes the church there. You know, the soon-to-be Corinthians there in Corinth were highly influenced, of course, by the worldview, the mindset, you know, that Karen, you know, has so well said. So this mindset, um, you know, based on Roman culture. And one of the big things in Roman culture was the idea of status and it was a gaining a status, maintaining a status, increasing your status. You know, that involved, uh, you know, money. Sometimes we have a little bit of shyness, I think, in our culture of exhibiting our riches or, or doing that. You know, there was no feeling of shyness about riches at all with the, with the Romans, none. You know, if you were rich, I mean, you flaunted it. It was in your face. And it was definitely 
you know, a definite advantage that made one more respectable. Um, it was like, you know, one was just being blessed by the gods. And, you know, therefore, you know, you're considered favored by said gods. And so that was another big thing in the Romans culture, being favored by the gods. So uh, like Athens, uh, they, you know, excellent skilled speakers, you know, were the heroes, you know, regardless of maybe whatever the truth they were saying um, and spoke. And again, how it eventually lined up with the gospel. You know, it was this seeking wisdom that was prevalent in the Greek areas. Uh, they listened and some responded to Paul's message. So after a year and a half of working, living, breathing, teaching and instructing, you know, these new saints, Paul eventually moved on to Ephesus. But these background mindset issues, uh, you know, I mean, they just bled over into their experience with each other. And then with future Christian teachers or future teachers that came. So Paul's at Ephesus, here's the church. And so, yeah, as a church, you know, they still had trouble grasping the concept of, you know, Paul's teaching about a divine life. You know, they struggled to see, you know, what uh, that unity was essential. You didn't have that with them. You know, maybe in the military, but that was about it. You know, people had their stations and places. You know, you had your strata that you existed in. And uh, you tried, again, your status to affect that strata. Um, they wrongly justified why they could continue to live sexual lives that directly oppose God's will. And, I mean, Paul did say to them, you know, Christ makes us free, Right. They took that a little too extreme. Uh, but that was, you know, their way of looking at things. You know, that's this other mindset that they had. Uh, so everyday sexual freedom and new ideas, you know, I mean, they were still gods, literally, you know, figuratively and literally. Because, you know, you had, you know, Aphrodite, you had all these other gods that covered these ideas. Um, you know, and they were part of the city's populace. Uh, the mindset of the city's populace. And, you know, it, apparently these views still had some prevalence within the church. All lifestyles and a grain mindset die hard because society viewed these things as a personal right and possession. So it was hard to let them go. And we've got that today. You know, I've got my rights. I've got, you know, you can't take this away from me because it's mine. You know, this personal possession of certain ideas that we have. So this probably kept Paul up at night wondering. And maybe with a little indigestion added. You know. So you know, here's Paul still in Ephesus. And then, you know, move forward a few years, you know, four or five years. And Paul heard of the moral problems within the Corinthian church you know, from Chloe's people. He talks about that in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, and then he writes a letter of instruction to him. You know, he calls that a, his a previous letter when in 1 Corinthians. And yes, Gary, I do believe that there are four letters. <laughs> Some commentaries don't, but uh, I think it's pretty evident. But anyway, kind of on a side note, at the end of 2 Corinthians, you know, Dave talked about the super apostles. You've read about the super apostles. I couldn't really find when they really came in. You know, it's, it could be at this point, you know, uh, after this first initial letter. I don't think so. It looks like that they came in because you've got first letter, this initial letter. You know, you, you got um, uh, First Corinthians writing. You know, then you've got Paul traveling to Corinth and then Paul doing a severe letter and then Second Corinthians. So it could be that these super apostles came in after his trip, uh, before his tr second trip, you know, before or after the severe letter, we just don't know. Um, but this is, but it could be even here. So just kind of think of that as we're going through, cause it, all the problems. Um, anyway, after this first, it was the first letter, of course it's lost. Uh, you've got 
you know, three guys that came up and they brought another letter saying, hey, we've got these further problems here in the church. You know, we've got questions on marriage, divorce, sacrifice, you know, idols, you know, food sacrifice to idols. How about the spiritual gifts we got? And of course, they looked at those spiritual gifts as a possession, not as a gift to be given. And that was one of the big problems. Um, and so on the basis of this letter and some other information, I think Paul would have received, you know, that's where we get him writing first Corinthians and getting this letter. And it was a pastoral letter that um, is sent out. And it seems that they didn't take kindly to the pastoring. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I wrote down and says, well, there was a pastoring or pasturing, you know, and you know, maybe they took it as the second one, maybe pasturing. Um, because this letter in quote is inferred, it seems like this just kind of stimulated further rebellion against Paul's authority. So oh, I should have had first slide, first slide. I forgot about that. I just blew past that one. Okay, the first side, you know, here's Paul. He's a good guy. He's manly. You know, he's does his stuff, works hard, you know, normal person. All right. Well, after this first letter, well, second letter, you know, one of the way you call first print, but after the second letter and this rebellion that's brewing about his authority, do the second slide. He was debunked. You know, there's a faction that says, we're fact checking you, Paul. And you know what? You don't measure up to our standards. You don't measure up to what we think. It's fact check. You know, and so, you know, he's going, dad, go. So with this, he realizes that, you know, I need to go visit these people. This is, this is just not going. I've got to go work this out. So we have what's called the, and referred to as a painful visit in Second Corinthians. And so he goes across in GNC from Ephesus back to Corinth, um, and he's going to resolve this crisis. And, you know, this is often I said, referred to as a painful visit. And he just, it just breaks his heart. Uh, it is, it's inferred that Paul was rebuffed by a group of members of the church. Uh, the opposition comes to a head with it seems one particular member leading a group and defying his authority. Um, you know, the visit was both difficult for Paul and for his converts. Um, it appears that the leadership in the church at the time took no really effective action, you know, in Paul's defense. You know, they were either active in repudiation of him and his message, you know, or they just remained silent. And, you know, Paul, deeply humiliated, basically left Corinth, you know, and the body there just tore itself apart. You know, when Dave and I were getting into the study, um, you know, I tried to put myself into Paul's skin and, and his being and just imagine, you know, imagine hearing what he heard. You know, think about that. You know, imagine seeing what's being played out around him. Here's these people he spent a year and a half with. You know, feeling sympathy from those, you know, who loved him and listened to him and cared for him. And yet the emptiness and the scorn that he got from those who were just rejecting him. You know, my thought was, you know, how, how can Paul stand this? Um, you know, I was going, you know, just think of the misery, the anxiety. He was sitting around, and everyone's going, you know, and it's falling apart. You know, because the very essence of who he was, I mean, if, 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 what, if what we infer is correct, the very essence of who he was was just being destroyed. And the basis of his life 
He was just being shoved back in his face as it was a dirty diaper, basically. Get out of here. Go. We don't want you. Now, Karen, you know, during your you know, mindset series and the church, you know, section, um, my mind, I, I recalled obscured images and situations about, you know, starting when I was little, you know, I, I had these images and, and just kind of coming back and observed them and observed uh, images of anger. You know, I observed obstinate stubbornness from people, you know, willfulness, disunity, you know, broken hearts. I remember my mom and dad and some friends sitting around the table after church on Sunday nights, just talking, drinking coffee and talking about it. Um, you know, destroyed relationships, congregational splits, um, you know, and whispered conversations of disparagement. You know, that tearing down of someone, that destroying someone's character. You know, and then really sadly remembering that I was a willing participant sometimes. You know, um, you know I feel spectacularly looking back. You know, and apparently so did the Corinthians in doing this. You know, looking and thinking about this, facing all this, how did Paul not lose heart? You know, how, how did he keep on? You know, there, there were, it seems, many different levels of understanding with them concerning Paul's teaching of Christ crucified. Um, Again, from what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, we can infer that you know, some man created a vision of the divine life that was different than Paul's. It was this group's failure to realize that they were called to participate in Christ's suffering of the cross. You know, and this led them to suppose that they could just bypass you know, Christ's shame and suffering and go directly to, you know, from them, a Roman understanding of honor and glory of their achievements. You know, the thought of their Christian experience in terms of this present life, so, you know, hey, we're going to have fun, have the joy, you know, and unrestrained freedom. Their mindset was to take pride in what is seen and in being seen. You know, and thus, you know, quantify everything you know, according to what is visible and what is in measurable results. And this resulted, um, or this result then, you know, with, was that they expected honor and position for themselves because position was real important in society. You know, and by Roman standards, you know, hey, how was my status? We've talked about that. Always kind of fell back to that. So as the congregational life evolved, and as things intermixed with ideas, you know, you know, those, the group that was opposed to Paul, you know, they had some serious issues and even despised their somewhat disreputable apostle. You know, Paul's always trying to tell them why he did what he did in Second Corinthians. Because they seem to be embarrassed, you know, by him and by worldly standards, you know, his lack of apparent success. You know, he's being persecuted by his enemies. He was being punished by Jewish authorities. He's being imprisoned by Roman officials, hounded from one city to another. And on top of everything else, just being repeatedly shipwrecked. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, hey, maybe this is, again, from a Roman standpoint, maybe this is a sign that the gods are trying to get rid of you. <laughs> you know, like you're not supposed to be around. Uh, you know, you, you're in, in disfavor of the gods. Remember, that was a big thing in society at the time was to be in favor, be found in favor of the gods. And, um, 
you know, I just, I go back to the end of Acts and his shipwreck on Malta. And so apparently that maybe might have been his fourth shipwreck. We don't know if there's any in between the times that he talked about. But again, the saving of the people, him getting to the island and the people there at the island helping him out. And then Paul going to try to gather firewood and then getting bit on the arm by the snake. And the way that Luke puts it out, of course, is that, you know, here's Paul. He wins over Poseidon again, you know, because, you know, Poseidon's God of the sea. And then they go, okay, you got the snake. You finally got your justice. And Luke puts down justice with a capital J because referring to the God of justice saying, she got you. And then we find out, no, I don't. My God is stronger than your gods. You know, that's one of the things in Luke that I love. But anyway, you know, they thought as, you know, the gods are trying to get rid of Paul, so will we. So what's the next step? It's Daniel up here. Don't cancel. You know, I mean, you know, this is today's society. You know, what? <laughs> Yeah. Everybody on Zoom, everybody loves the sound effects. So let's go to the next step. You know, why did Paul feel? You know, here he is. He's, you know, he's been canceled. He's going back to Ephesus after this disastrous, painful meeting. You know, um, his essence, his personal integrity, you know, his message were rejected and was, again, basically said, you don't matter. You know, if I'm, again, in Paul's skin, I'm, you know, I'm going, that's it. I'm done. You know, that's my, re- that's my reaction. You know, um, you know, been thinking, you know, well, it really, you know, doesn't matter if they really get it. And then part of it going, uh, does it, what difference does it make anyway? You know, the painful visit didn't accomplish his goal. And then after he turned to Ephesus, Paul wrote his third letter, again, which we don't have, but it's called a severe letter. You know, and to me, that's kind of like him basically shouting at him. You're going, hey, okay. You don't think it matters. You don't think this message can make a difference. Okay, hey. Hey, everybody. This, this is what matters. Wherever he wrote, this is what matters. And I'm not going to ditch you and I'm not going to write you off because I do not lose heart. You know, I mean, this letter, you know, he said, I think, you know, I said something like this. And he also said, you know, because I don't lose heart, I, you know, I love you guys. I've given you everything. I mean, if Paul tore up to write this letter, you know, he says, out of much affection and anguish of heart and with many tears. You know, this isn't Paul. You know, and in that same situation, but at, I think, you know, chapter 12, you know, Paul, great, Paul goes, but you drove me to it. 
I was, you know, I had to write this stupid thing because you drove me to it. You know, the letter left Paul almost sorry that he had to write it. Again, it's inferred that, you know, he required them to discipline the man or, or the people, basically the man who led the effort in defying his apostolic authority. You know, so Titus takes the letter, goes to Corinth, and, you know, he's in an attempt to help reconcile the situation. You know, again, I wonder what Paul said, because it seems that this letter was, you know, quite effective, and it produced repentance. Of course, Paul was on penance and needles. He couldn't stand it. Yeah, it was, you know, to think that this just consumed him. Uh, you know, he was so anxious to hear from Titus. What's the news? What's the news? You know, he travels to Troas, and he keeps on trying to find, uh, you know, Titus, and probably in Philadelphia, or Philadelphia, <laughs> in Philippi, you know, he probably runs into Titus there, and Titus goes, they listened. It worked. You know, the church, you know, Apparently, the leader of the rebellion had been rejected and disciplined. You know, the church, once again, was open to Paul's counsel and desirous of his friendship. You know, majority opinion had shifted back to Paul. And with this news, I hope Paul's ulcer had started healing at the time. So after this, you know, Paul wrote his fourth letter now, which we have as Second Corinthians. You know, I see the need where Paul, you know, needed to shore up his shaky foundation with his believers and his need to reconcile with them. You know, this letter is still a reconciliation letter. The first seven chapters are, you know, here's, here's how we need to get together. And, um, and all the while he was writing this, he was directing them you know, to the true glory of divine life, all that's inner space within it. You know, deeper though, um, I'd never looked at this letter as being such a beautiful, soulful response you know, to the massive amount of hurt and crushing despair that Paul must have gone through these couple of years. And as it took long, it took a different you know, light. It was just not a letter of correction, not just a letter of, you know, justification of, you know, hey, you know, here's my credentials. You know, it, it was, it reflected all this pain and suffering that he had gone through. He writes it in a little different terms, but he went through a lot of misery and a lot of despair. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why Dave last week uh, showed the video of Spurgeon of that beautiful speech where he says, Emmanuel, God with us, and all the definitions that goes with that. But yet Spurgeon battled depression all of his life. You need to look up. Um, I wrote it down. Where is it? There's a little paper that says, did you know that Charles Spurgeon struggled with depression and it talks about how uh, in church one day some kids yelled fire and everybody rushed out and I don't know, eight or nine people were killed a bunch were hurt and that tore him up the rest of his life and so you know I look at Paul and I go you know he got back and reconciled with him. But you can tell in Second Corinthians, especially in the last, you know, three chapters, there's still, there's still issues. You know, he's still working with them. He's still pulling for them. He's still trying to get them to understand. You know, so Paul writes this letter and he says, open your spiritual eyes and see I am really who I say I am. 
you know, he focuses on God's mercy, comfort, you know, the mission. You know, he talks about the mission of reconciliation, redemption, Christ's suffering grace on the cross, his own suffering gift to his mission and to them. You know, and God's loving mercy, the reconciliation. And he stresses the gift of a glorious life with the outcome being for this given life that we have. The outcome is we give it to others. It is given to others. You know, I think he achieves this for them by offering his faith as testimony. You know, he opens himself up. He said, and he does this, you know, with the gift of divine truth and glory and light in the reality of his soul and life. He says, this is where my source is. This is where my treasure is. This is where my light is. It's yours. I give it to you. Know that. He says that human weakness is in the humble moment for the power of God to act. My interpretation. That's what I read. Still, there's that stern point at the very end of the chapter where he says, you know, all this I'm writing to you, all this opening up to you, all this here. You know, so whatever invention and distorted image that has been created and possibly still in your minds, you know, by those, you know, that oppose me, this lie, I want it shattered. I don't want it thrown into the dustbin and into the pigsty because we need to move on. Chapter four uh, kind of grabbed me. Good, we got time. I want to read chapter four. If you got it, good. I'm reading from the uh, Berean Study Bible. I like the way it puts this. Um, you know, NIV's good, ESV's good, you know, but. Uh, I just like the way the Brian said it. So therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this ministry, we do not lose heart. Instead, we have reconciled, uh, instead we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not practice deceit, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by proclamation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, you know, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, you know, he's referring to Satan, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus now we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassingly great power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on all sides, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, <clears throat> but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always <clears throat> carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 
we who are alive are always consigned to Jesus, to the death of Jesus. Excuse me. For we who are alive are always consigned to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life, life is at work in you. And in keeping with what is written, I believe, therefore I've spoken, we who have the same spirit of faith also believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is extended and extending to more and more people may overflow in thanksgiving to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though our outer, outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Again, as Paul, you know, finishes his letter, you know, as he ends his dictation, you know, I can see him you know, picking up the, you know, the papyrus, you know, him intensely looking at the drying ink and thinking, yeah, all I have is yours. It is a treasure from, to be from God and forever to you. You know, see him saying, remember and believe all that God has is yours. Till next time. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever thought about our expression called a school of thought? Yeah. And where it comes from? It, it not only in in Greek society, we sort we tend to think about the the Greeks of uh, Aristotle and Socrates and Euclid and all that bunch is one cohesive group. It wasn't. No. They're competing schools of thought, just as and and in the same way, uh, the, our Jewish ancestors had uh, when they asked Jesus, "Where did you get the authority?" What they're really asking is, "What rabbi do you follow that gave you this authority?" Because there there are long lines of uh, mm -hmm. and, and the lines of thought, the schools of thought were handed down from time to time and they compete and they, they uh, uh, disparage each other just as Christians, unfortunately, do. You know, if you're Baptist, you're all once saved, always saved. If you're Presbyterian, uh, it's all predestined. If you're somebody else, you're, you know. And what you were frustrated, you expressed frustrating as a child of this disparaging other Christians most, a lot of us are guilty of it. And, yeah. and anyway, so when Paul shows up, he is, he doesn't have a school behind him. In this foreign culture, he's bringing something that's entirely different. And the key, in my view, is the resurrection. And he testifies to that. And he uh, calls upon witnesses to that. And he says, 
the real God is eternal and all the ones you're worshiping are nothing. Right. And that's not a popular message. Yeah. And, but I really like what you did. Though. That explains greatly. Thanks, Lawrence. It really does help. So that really does help. Again, you know, a lot of this is inferred. You know, it's it's looking at Second Corinthians and trying to figure out, you know, what what was going on. You know, because that's no way of knowing. You know, but knowing human nature and knowing what Paul wrote, you know, this you know, the possible probable, this is more along the probable. So, all right, let's get some coffee and, <laughs> and enjoy some donuts, I guess. <laughs>